You've got shit. I've got shit. We've all got shit. So let's therapize that shit with your host, me, Joy Gerhard. Okay. Um, there's no, I never know how to start these things. So I'm just going to start talking. Um, since my last recording, I, uh, um, my partner broke up with me. Um, um, we were living together and I was working for him. Um, and so kind of in one fell swoop, I lost my housing situation. Um, my partner, um, one of my best friends and, uh, my job for now. Um, so I figured now would be a good time to talk about how I'm coping with that, um, kind of in the thick of it, rather than waiting for, you know, coming out on the other side and everything sunshine and rainbows and whatever. Um, so... I'm going to talk about um, some BBT skills that I've used, um, and but first a little bit of background about why I love DBT and why um, what's useful about it. You know that um, that quote or that maxim that it takes ten thousand hours to master something. Um, that's really only the case if you're using your skills. If you're practicing effectively, like if you're trying to learn piano and I actually don't remember if I've already talked about this last time, um, but if you're trying to learn piano and you're just sitting down at a piano and banging your head against the keys, you could do that for 10,000 hours and probably give yourself multiple concussions, but you would not learn how to play Beethoven or Bach or really anybody else who's not a white European man. Um, so it's all about practicing in an, in an effective way that actually has you get better at the skills, which is why, you know, athletes have coaches, um, why it's useful to have somebody who can look at your situation from the outside and have a bit more um, perspective, I guess. And that is to me invaluable, which is one of the reasons why I love therapy. It's lovely to have somebody who can be familiar with your situation and also outside of it so that they can say, hey, do you notice you default to this pattern? Hey, do you notice that you keep, you know, saying these same things over and over again? So I um I love DBT because it is it's a skills based thing. It's about practicing a skill, multiple skills. Um about practicing them when you're not in distress so that they're accessible to you when you are in the same way that you know since we just have the Olympics, we'll use Olympics as a, an example. Um you know, Simone Biles doesn't practice her routines, her gymnastics routines at the Olympics. She practices them at a gym with no audience. She practices them with those squishy foam pits so that if she makes a mistake, it's not fatal. You know, she practices them with extra padding and a whole host of other things and works her way up to... Um, being able to do it on a world stage under the highest possible amount of pressure. And if the one of the greatest gymnasts of all time does it that way, of course, we, we regular humans would do have to do it that way too. the need to practice when you're not in distress when it's not the end of the world. Um, so and a lot of these skills, when I when I'm going to name them, um, 
feel are going to sound like fortune cookie wisdom. They're going to sound like really super hyper obvious things that you're like, well, of course. Um, and it is the, that that's the distinction between banging your head against the piano and actually practicing effectively. Th these skills are, are actually really specific um, in the same way that when you practice piano, you play specific notes. You don't just play whatever you want. When Simone Biles practices her, her tumbling passes, she practices in a specific way. It's not just, it's not enough to be like, hey, I'm going to go sit on the, you know, sit on a trampoline or sit on a, a balance beam and call that practice. Um, it's not enough to rub up against these skills. It's not enough to, you know, talk about these skills. What's actually really super important is the, the effective practice of them. So let's talk a little bit about um, the skills that I've been using. Um, so kind of the, one of the first ones, um, that I used in that conversation where my partner broke up with me was, um, I used a mindfulness skill that's called, uh, participate. Um, and it's about being fully 100% pre um, present, throwing yourself completely into the activity of the current moment. Don't separate yourself. I'm, I'm reading right now from Marshall Linehan's DBT um, book. Um, don't separate yourself from what's going on in the moment. Become one with whatever you're doing, completely forgetting yourself. Throw your attention to the moment. Do just what is needed in each situation. Go with the flow and respond with spontaneity. Um, so that conversation that we were having, um, I, it started off with just kind of a simple conversation about where we were at financially. And, uh, I don't know about you guys, but you know, when you're ta when I'm talking about a, a hard co topic, uh, my mind will kind of go all over the place. I will want to come up with solutions. I will want to um, fix it. I will want to um, think of all of the ways that I screwed up. Think of all of the ways the other person screwed up. Um, think of a lot of the woulda, coulda, shouldas, you know, which are all self-judgment. Well, they're all, I mean, not even self-judgment. If you're judging somebody else, it's just plain old judgment. Um, and so participating fully means that um, in that moment, all of those thoughts still came up. And I had to practice going, okay, there's that thought. I don't have to do anything with that thought. We're just going to let that thought come up and go by because our, our brains are thought making machines. That's what they do. They make thoughts. Um, that's what our, yeah, it's not all your brain does clearly because your brain also, you know, manages your heart rate and hormones and various and sundry other things. And I'm sure anybody listening to this who is a neuroscientist is shaking their fist at the oversimplification I'm making of what the brain does. So we'll say it this way. The part of the brain that thinks, that's all it does. It will make thoughts all day long. And not all of them are going to be winners. Um, you know, um, I will often have the thought, there's no hope. I will often have the thought, uh, I should just give up. Um, I will often, you know, have just like all st yesterday, I was sitting in the basement of my parents' house going through all of 
the stuff that I had shoved into plastic bags and trying to separate them out into, I'm going to, I'm just going to cry through this guys. So, you know, it's going to happen. Um, I was just sorting through shit and I had a Backstreet Boys song pop into my head. Um, I had a movie scene pop into my head that had literally nothing to do with whatever it was that I was doing. Um, those are thoughts that I had. I had the thought, I will never be ha happy. I had the thought that I've gone backwards in my life and I'm now back where I was eight years ago. I had those thoughts and um, I know from a lot a lot a lot of experience that trying to challenge those thoughts trying to convince myself oh those are factually inaccurate kind of entrenched entrench those thoughts further because they're invalidating they're telling those thoughts you're wrong you're stupid why would you think that um and there's a reason why i thought those things those thoughts come from somewhere I mean, all thoughts are caused, even if the cause is a some something so subconscious that you can't identify it. You know, I mean, if if we spent the time to actually look and do like some archaeological level digging into every thought we had, I'm sure we would find that each one it comes from someplace. There's a phrase we heard, a thing we saw, and then of course your thought does that train, you know, the train of thoughts, and 27 steps down, you're like, oh, that's why I thought of pink elephants. Um, they're all cost, they all come from somewhere. And that doesn't mean they all point to the truth. It's the truth, it is fact that you had that thought. That is factually accurate. And having that thought doesn't make it, doesn't make that thought, whatever you're thinking, fact. I can have the thought, I'm a pink elephant. That does not make me a pink elephant. Um, I can have the thought, um, there's no hope. That doesn't make it factually true that there is no hope. It, what it is, is, and here's, here's how you validate that thought. Of course you're, I'm really going to cry through this. Of course you're having the thought that there is no hope. You lost your partner. You lost the life you were building together. You lost the future that you thought you were going to have. You lost your, your home that you built with him. And right now you can't see a way to regain any of those things, to have a new home, to have a new life and a new future. You can't see that right now. So of course you're going to have the thought, there's no hope. And that's, that's all there is to say to that thought. Of course, you're going to have the thought you've gone backwards. There are a lot of things that are similar today that were true eight years ago. Eight years ago, you didn't have a job. You were in extremely bad financial situation. You were living with your parents. You didn't have a partner. Um, you were experiencing significant mental health issues and didn't have support. And all of those things are true, were true eight years ago and they're true now. <laughs> Um, so it makes total sense that you would have that thought and that you would be struggling to see the differences between then and now. 
And there are differences, actually, that just came to mind. Um, eight years ago, I didn't have my best friends. I have a lovely little pod of people who also um, are very familiar with mental health struggles and are actively working on their mental health and who are in therapy and who understand. I didn't have those people eight years ago. I was not on Medicaid eight years ago. And I am now, and that's helpful. Um, um, other differences. Um, eight years ago, I had never been to therapy. I didn't have any DBT skills. I wasn't on um, depression medication, and I am now. So there's a lot of ways I'm actually more equipped now than I was eight years ago. Um, eight years ago, I really didn't know how to set boundaries. Um, so when I was living with my parents eight years ago, <laughs> our relationship was really super strained. My experience of going through therapy has had significant ripple effects um, to people in my life, um, my sisters, my parents, um, and their friends and fa and well, their family is me, but um, like it's rippled out. Um, so, like my relationship with my parents is better now. My dad said something yesterday that I've never, never heard him say before. He said something, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, I can't imagine how painful this is for you. And how overwhelmed you must feel. And... My dad is, is the guy who, you know, when I'm having a bad day, his first response is, oh, what do you find encouraging lately? He's, like, unflinchingly positive. Um, and through my life hasn't really, throughout my life hasn't really been able to sit with negative emotions in a helpful way. He's been really 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 invalidating um so for him to say that it was kind of a big deal and that's not something he would have said eight years ago so that's something that i that i um notice is a difference from eight years ago but and all of these things that i just mentioned are things that just came to mind right now and they would not have come to mind if I had told that thought, you're an idiot, you know, this isn't the same as eight years ago, buck up, stop wallowing. Because those saying those things or even being like aggressively positive, it's like, yeah, but there's so much, there's so many, so many good things in your life and there's so much to be thankful for. What those things are, they're invalidating and they're not intended to be invalidating. When somebody says those things, they're not like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go out of my way to say something that will totally diminish this person's experience. Most of the time when I encounter somebody who's invalidating, um, it's, it's somebody who doesn't have the space, the time or the skill to sit with how, whatever I'm feeling because sitting with somebody else's emotions can be really challenging to sit with somebody else's grief or sadness or anger or fear can, can
can feel like a lot, especially if you're you're already in a space where you're maxed out and you don't have the ba- you don't have the bandwidth. So I totally get why you know people say and do invalidating things. And I get why I myself invalidate myself. Um, I don't want to sit with this feeling. I don't want to sit with these emotions. I'm, I'm and afraid we're going to decline them. Thank you. You're hearing my parents in the background right now. We're going to decline them. They just got a, a telemarketer phone call. Okay. I, I would like you to talk to my husband. Hello? Oh, this is fun. Um, anyway, so getting back to that skill of... Um, Observe, like there's a thought that's coming up um, that thought makes sense that thought comes from somewhere it it's totally it's it's valid in so much as it makes sense within the context of my life that I would have that thought um, Validating someone isn't about agreeing with them, isn't about, I'm actually going to look that up, hang on, let's see, validation, oh look, I turned right to it, that was magical, um, let's talk about validation for a second, because it's actually a super, super helpful skill, it's, it's, in um, the DBT handbook, it's listed as a interpersonal effective, effectiveness skill, um, I think, Honestly, I think it's it's actually like it's a distress tolerance skill, it's an emotional regulation skill, and it's a mindfulness skill. Um, because what um, this is how um, Marshall Linehan puts it in the DBT handbook: with words and actions, show that you understand the other person's feelings and thoughts about the situation. And it also is true for yourself: show that you under that you understand your own thoughts and feelings about the situation, see the world from the other person's point of view, and then act on or say on, then act on or, <laughs> this is weird, then say or act on what you see. I realize this is hard for you. I see that you are busy. Um, for examples, here's, there's levels of validation. Um, I'm kind of all over the place right now. I'm trying to synthesize this into a um, synthesize this into something sensical. So let's talk more about what validation means. Finding the kernel of truth in another person's perspective or situation, verifying the facts of a situation. So if you know, if I'm talking to myself and I have the thought, this is hopeless. Validating is not going, you're right, it is hopeless. Validating is, of course you'd have the thought that it's hopeless. Of course that's the thought you would have. It is true that you're having that thought. Acknowledge that a person's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors have causes and are therefore understandable. Um, A lot of times I will just jump to well, of course you'd have that thought, or of course you'd have that feeling, and then look for the for what why it makes sense. Like I, I, over the process of doing all this DBT stuff, I've that is my I've God, I'm a mess. Um, that's the judgment. Um, I now, after practicing this skill for many years, I now have the default setting of it makes sense. Even if I can't see it yet, it makes sense. So let's then dig into why it makes sense. But start from the place of it makes sense. It is not necessarily, so getting back to reading here, it's not necessarily agreeing with the other person and not validating what is actually invalid. Um, so again, like I said, it's not saying you're right, the situation is hopeless, you're right, you've gone backwards in your life, you've made no progress whatsoever. Those those are not valid statements. What is valid is that it is valid that you have that thought. It is valid that you're experiencing those emotions. Um, what's the point of validating? 
It improves our relationships by showing we are listening and understand. It improves interpersonal effectiveness by reducing the pressure to prove who is right. It reduces negative reactivity. It reduces anger. It makes problem solving closeness and support possible. And for me, the big one, why, in, why validate? Because invalidation hurts. Um, I really think this is an, uh, an emotional regulation skill, like seriously, because it was only when I started being able to validate myself that I could validate others. Um, I know that for some people that the exact opposite will be the case. It will be validating yourself will be the harder of the things. Um, and it will be so much easier to see how other people's experiences is valid. Um, so much easier than seeing how your own, own is. And it comes from, I think it's born out of how much self-judgment you experience. Um, but seriously, for me, I, once I learned to validate myself, it removed the pressure on other people to validate me. Um, kind of like once you learn to swim, it removes the pressure to have, you know, some like to have a life jacket or to have somebody there to save you. Um, it's a skill you can do for yourself. Um, and it's, I mean, if, if you're going to practice, like it's so lovely to practice for yourself. You can do it at any time. You don't have to wait for a conversation with somebody else. Um, though it's also actually really fun to do it when you're watching a movie. Um, you know, actually a lot of these DBT, DBT skills are fun to do when watching movies. It's like, that person just said something that I'm judging. Pause. How does it make sense? Uh, and uh, so there are ways to practice it, not on yourself and not around other people. Um, but I love, I love that it's very much a self, a, re, a reflect, like a reflective skill. Like it, you can use it on yourself, um, to great effect. Um, important things to validate the valid and only the valid, the facts of a situation, a person's experiences, feelings, emotions, beliefs, opinions, and thoughts or thoughts about something suffering and difficulties. Um, and I want to clarify on what a fact is. Um, I use the analogy for myself. It's like if an alien were standing in the corner of the room, it's what that alien would be recording. So an alien doesn't know anything about our, what our body language means or, you know, what tone of voice means or anything. All they can say is like, so this is how an alien would record it. Instead of she's pissed off, an alien would say, her arms are crossed, she's leaning away from me, her brow is furrowed, her mouth is turned down, she's speaking in a, a loud voice, um, she's enunciating her words and speaking really quickly, um, she's gesticulating um, in a very punctuated manner. Um, like those are descriptions. Those are facts. Um, now, if I said to the alien, I'm angry, the fact that the alien would record would not be she's angry. The fact is she said, I said, she's, or, let's use the correct pronouns here. She said she's angry. Um, we all the time say things that are not accurate. I say it's hopeless. That's not accurate. So the fact is that I said it's hopeless. The fact is not it's hopeless. So when somebody says I'm really pissed off at you, the fact that you can validate is that, yep, that is what you said, that you're really pissed off at me. Which is not an excuse to like gaslight people and be like, yeah, but you really don't know how you're feeling. But that's, that's the only thing you're responsible to react to. 
is just that's a thing that person said. Um, and oftentimes when you dig into it and start validating the hell out of another person, it turns out what's really underneath everything is sadness, frustration, um, anxiety. What the, that person said was, I'm angry. Um, so, yeah, it's the facts. You validate the facts. Um, you validate, yes, it's a fact that you had that thought. Yes, it's a fact that you're experiencing the emotion of anger. It's a fact that you said you're experiencing the emotion of anger. Um, so we can certainly talk more about this. We're going to talk more about this, but that's where we're going to start. Um, some things to remember about uh, validation. Every invalid response makes sense in some way. So even something that you have the experience of, like, that's totally invalid, it comes from somewhere. It makes sense. Validation is not necessarily agreeing, doesn't necessarily mean you like it. You know, my partner saying he doesn't want to be in a relationship. I don't like that at all. <laughs> my ex-partner, my former partner, saying he doesn't want to be in a relationship. I, I really don't like that. So how do I validate that? Well, I don't even know if that's the truth, to be honest. Um, I don't even know if he knows if that's his, the truth. It's the thought he's having right now. And I mean, I understand that thought. I'm an introvert and there are times I just want to be alone. And there are times when I'm like, I can't even stand the idea of sharing a life with somebody. And it usually comes from a place of something is not working. There's something that has gone unaddressed, something, some dysfunction, something that's really bothering me that makes my interaction with somebody else painful to the point where I'm like, fuck people, I'm out. So it's hard to validate something without a lot of information. It's hard to validate something all the way down to the bottom because there's multiple levels of validating. Um, but it's, it's hard to do that without asking some questions. Um, so in my case, when he said I, he just wants to be alone, I had to ask some questions. Um, and also I was, yeah, I'm lucky enough that he is somebody who's able to communicate effectively how he's feeling in his thought process. So he also volunteered a lot of information. Um, so here's what I learned over the course of that conversation. Um, I learned that he's feeling overwhelmed by my mental health. He's having the experience that he's trying as hard as he possibly can, and it's not working. That's his experience. Now, I don't have to agree um, with that. I can't argue. I can't say whether or not he's trying as hard as he can. And I can't say whether or not it's effective. Like, I mean, that's his experience. He's having the experience that no matter what he does, it's not helping. And I mean, we're going to use all the analogies today. A six-year-old gets up to bat at the World Series and keeps striking out. And the six-year-old says, no matter what I do, we're going to lose. That's, I understand having that thought, um, and it is factually true that you as a six-year-old are not going to be able to win the World Series. What's not true is that you'll never be able to win the World Series. Like, we don't know. Um, there are skills that you can learn. There are coaches that you can have um, that 
would make that more attainable. So is it factually true for my partner that there's nothing he could do that would be of, of help? No, that's not true at all. Um, there are things he could do that would be extremely beneficial. Um, and he doesn't have those skills. And it may not even feel beneficial to him. He may not have the experience of, oh my God, this is super helpful. Um, and that's where he's at right now. Um, I have talked to him several times, asked him to go to therapy because I think it would help him and it would also help me. Um, part of it's selfish and part of it's not. Um, because I see that there are just skills he doesn't have. He doesn't know how to validate. Um, he doesn't know how to sit with his own emotions. He doesn't know how to be okay um, around somebody uh, that he can't help. Um, so a lot of what he's experiencing is overwhelm and hopelessness. And of course he would feel that way if he doesn't have the skills to manage that. Um, so when he said, you know, nothing I do is helping and I've tried, I'm trying as hard as I can and nothing I'm doing is helping. I could be invalidating and be like, bullshit, you could try harder. You could do this. You could do that. You could do this other thing. Or I could say, I get it. Um, you don't have the wherewithal to show up in a way that is actually supportive. You are emotionally wrung out. You are at the end of your rope. And so nothing else is attainable right now. Um, he's not able to problem solve. He's not able to do a lot of things. Um, He's at the bottom and when he's at the bottom, what he, his default is to isolate because that's what he's done his entire life. That's what he experiences as the most kind thing he can do to the people that he loves because he, his experience is that when he's in this place, it's hurtful to other people. So he's just going to remove himself from that situation. And you'll notice like, as I'm saying all of this, I'm not saying any of this is fact. I'm saying this is his experience. These are the thoughts he's having. These are the emotions he's having. And like, I kind of see it like, you ever met anybody who uses a butter knife as a screwdriver? Like they will unscrew face plates with a butter knife. It's because that's the tool they have access to. Nobody has ever unscrewed a faceplate with a butter knife who owns a screwdriver. If you own a screwdriver, you're gonna use that. Use a butter knife because you don't have a screwdriver. So him isolating, him wanting to be alone, him rejecting a relationship is what you do when you don't have skills to address how you're feeling. Um, or to communicate how you're feeling. Um, he, he's also said that he is never going to be certain about his desire to be in a relationship. He will always be uncertain and that it's clear that doesn't work for me. Um, again, what is there to validate? It certainly does not work for me, but his uncertainty, that is accurate. That doesn't work for me. Um, and he is having the thought he'll never know for sure. And that's just the way he's wired. That's the thought he's having. It makes sense that that's the thought he's having. And I, I know that because he's expressed over and over again, his wiring towards kind of, you know, the grass is greener, FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, he's kind of always second guessing. Um, his his choices and always kind of looking for new opportunities. 
Um, and so it makes sense that, that if, you know, that's his experience, that he's always wondering about the, the path not traveled and questioning and doubting his choices, it would make sense that his experience then is that he doesn't think he'll ever be sure uh, about wanting to spend his life with me. And those doubts, like his, his doubting, also makes sense. Like we can go all the way back. Why does it make sense that he, that he doubts? Um, and that, that makes sense on some level. I can guess. I actually haven't, we haven't dug into this, um, in conversation. Um, so I'm guessing that, um, well, just, I know that there's, there's a contentment is a skill choosing just to choose is a skill, um, sitting with, um, those thoughts, the what ifs and not doing anything with them is a skill. So some people, you know, kind of come out of the womb seemingly with these, like they're just naturally content. Some people have to learn how to be content. Um, and he doesn't have that skill. So of course he has the experience of always second guessing, always looking for new opportunities, always considering the grass is greener. And if he has that experience, then he certainly has the experience of never knowing whether our relationship is what he wants. Um, and then of course that would lead me to have the experience of never being sure about his commitment. So like, it all makes sense. Um, and again, some of those were guesses on my part. If I were actually in conversation with him, I would, I could ask. But I just wanted to give some examples of what it looks like to validate somebody. Um, and also to validate, you know, yourself. Um, so I want to talk about the levels of validation because I brought that up a little bit earlier. Um, So you can pay attention to start with, look interested, listen and observe. I like that it's look interested because oftentimes when you start, you're not interested. So it's like you, you pretend, act as if you have faith and faith will be given to you. Fake it till you make it. Um, you start by acting interested. Don't multitask, make eye contact, stay focused, nod. Respond with your face, you know, smile at happy statements, look concerned when hearing something painful. Um, reflect back, say back what you heard and observe to be sure you actually understand what the person's saying, which does not include any, like, don't be judgmental, but either in your language or your tone. Um, so an example of that, my original DBT therapist used to do this and it was so beautiful. Um, an example of not using a judgmental tone, I would say something about like, I, I don't know why I did that. That was stupid. And she would say, why did you do that? Which is a different question than, yeah, why did you do that? The first one is coming from that default position of, I know it makes sense. Let's see how. Um, and that is distinct from, you know, yeah, you're an idiot. You shouldn't have done that. Um, even though the words are exactly the same, why did you do that? As opposed to, why did you do that? Um, you can see how the tone of voice um, is different. Um, so reflecting back is trying to really get what the person feels or thinks, you know, an open mind, which means you can't disagree, criticize, or try to change the person's mind or goals, which for a lot of people will seem really, really like, why would, yeah, but they're wrong. I have to change their opinion. Um, no, 
practice not trying to change somebody's opinion just for one conversation. Practice trying to understand. Then after this conversation, you can go right back to judging. Um, but it's just something to try. Um, use a tone of voice that allows the other person to correct you and check the facts. So an example is, so you're mad at me because you think I lied just to get back to you, just to get back at you. Did I get that right? Which is a very distinct, like, so you're mad at me because you think I lied just to get back at you? That's a very different statement, you know? One is ju communicating judgment, like you're an idiot um, for thinking that. The other is, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. And this also is really important with yourself. You can reflect back to yourself. So when I was unpacking my stuff in the basement yesterday, and I had, I had a thought um, that uh, I'm back where I was eight years ago. Um, I can reflect that back to myself and say, okay, so you're having the thought that where you are in your life right now is the same as where you were eight years ago, and that you this is a movement backwards, farther away from the life you want. So it's reflecting back with adding a little, a little more to it. And oftentimes, I can't tell you the number of times I reflected back to somebody exactly what they've said and had them go, no, that's not what I meant at all. And that's, that's one of the reasons why validation is so important, because we don't always say the things we mean, which isn't, a, again, it's not a carte blanche to go around and ch say, tell people, you don't actually know what you're thinking. You don't actually know what you're feeling. Um, trust me, I'm the superior wise being who can tell you what you're thinking. Like, this is gaslighting to the, the max right there. And all I'm saying is that oftentimes when you reflect back what somebody says, they will realize that they did not communicate what they meant to effectively. And they will give you more details or flesh it out differently or shift it a little bit. Either way, no harm has ever come from repeating back to somebody, this is what I'm hearing, do I have that right? Um, the third step for validation is to read minds. Um, be sensitive to what is not being said by the other person. Pay attention to facial expressions, body language, what's happening, and what you know about the person already. Show that you understand in words or by your actions. Also be open to correction. Um, so my partner says he doesn't want to be in a relationship. And he's crying when he says it. And he hardly ever cries. Um, and it took him a long time to get it out. And he hemmed and hawed about it. Um, so if I were to validate that, I could say, what I'm hearing is that you are overwhelmed and you want to isolate and you're having the thought that that is diametrically opposed to being in a relationship. Um, that you can't be in a relationship and want to be away from people. You're, that's the thought you're having. And this is causing you a tremendous amount of distress. It's been weighing on you for a really long time. You feel really sad about it. Then you really wish this weren't the case. And a lot of that is actually born out of the conversation I had with him. Um, because he did tell me he wished it weren't the case. He wished it were different. He, you know, he wished it would have worked out. Um, 
So, but like, it is causing him a lot of distress. And that's like, I got that from his body language, from the fact that he was crying, from the fact that it took him so long to get it out. Um, he's really sad. He's really, really sad. And I'm really, really sad about it. Um, yeah, because it sucks. Um, so, like, validating his sadness. And, and it's really hard for him to get it out. Um, that, those are kind of the, the more mind reading. And if I'm wrong, you know, like, it's possible. You read somebody's mind and you say, you look really tired or you look really discouraged. And the person can be like, no, that's just my resting bitch face. Like, it's great to, to say it out loud and get, you know, check the facts. You might have it completely wrong. Um, level four. So we've talked about level one is pay attention. Two is reflecting it back. Three is reading minds, so paying attention to what's not being said and what you know about that person. Four is understanding. So look for how the other person feels, how they're thinking, how they're making sense, given the person's history, state of mind or body, current events, i.e. the causes, even if you don't approve of their behavior or if their beliefs are, or agree that their beliefs are correct. Look for how it makes sense. Um, because it does. All behavior is caused. It all comes from somewhere, even if the cause is completely invisible to us. Even if the cause is from trauma that you've completely blocked from your mind and you will never remember it, it comes from somewhere. Um, even if the, the cause is something from, you know, childhood trauma that is before, you know, you could form memories. Um, even if the, the cause is something buried so deep, you can't access it right now. Like, all of our behavior is caused. Um, so look for, look for understanding. And even if, even if that's as close as you can get, like, look, it makes sense that you feel this way even if I can't see how it makes sense. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. It does not mean it doesn't make sense, period. Um, acknowledging the valid is step five or level five. It shows that you see that the other person's thoughts, feelings, or actions are valid given the current reality and facts. And then act as if the person's behavior is valid. So I want to give an example of, of self-validation, acknowledging the valid. Um, I was judging myself yesterday for sitting in the basement, staring into space for an hour. And... I mentioned this to one of my good friends, and she said, uh, of course you would do that. Your body is experiencing a huge overwhelm of grief. It makes sense that there are times when all you can do is sit and stare at the wall. So I've been practicing saying that. Like, it makes sense that right now I don't want to feel things. It makes sense that right now I don't want to do anything. <laughs> because I lost the life I thought I was going to have. And my brain is so overwhelmed by that. That I can't problem solve. I can't plan. I can't do the effective thing. So I'm just going to do what I can do. And sometimes that is just staring at a wall. <sighs> um, show equality is, is level six. 
So be yourself. Don't one up or one down the person. Treat them as an equal, not as fragile or incompetent. So be willing to admit mistakes. Um, ask for their opinion. Give up being defensive. Be careful in giving advice or telling someone what to do if you're not asked or required. Even then, remember you could be wrong. So, like, with my partner, what I wanted to say to him was like, oh, I'm sorry, you're feeling overwhelmed? I'm the one who has spent two separate week-long visits at a mental hospital this year and left the company I founded and is about to lose their home and have to move back in with their parents. Like, you know, part of me is annoyed at his overwhelm. I'm like, I want to say, you know, I want to be, it's defensive. I, I want him to acknowledge my overwhelm um, and to change his behavior to accommodate my overwhelm. Um, and that's not effective. Um, especially because everybody's overwhelm is different. What overwhelms a six-year-old would not overwhelm, you know, a 35-year-old necessarily. That's why I love seeing toddlers melt down in grocery stores. Um, like, they are so overwhelmed by disappointment, anger, frustration, and not getting to get the, the item that they want. They actually, their bodies cannot handle it, which is why they melt down and have a tenter, temper tantrum. Um, you tell most adults, no, you can't have a Snickers and they won't melt down unless we're in one of those Snickers commercials. Cause you're not you when you're hungry. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, everybody has, a, has different skill levels and is dealing with different, um, different loads. Um, think of like spinning plates. I could probably keep two plates spinning because I'm not a professional plate spinner. I know that there are professional plate spinners who can keep like 15 plates spinning. Um, and so to judge me for not being able to keep 15 plates spinning is not really fair. And it's not in keeping with the reality of the situation. Um, and my partner doesn't have the skills to handle what he's going through right now. So of course he feels overwhelmed. Now I could look at it and be like, Oh my God, if you just learned these 17 skills, you'd be fine. Um, how realistic is that? It took me a year of skills group. And during a year you go through the whole DBT manual twice a year of skills group, which is two and a half hours a week and a year of individual DBT therapy, which was an hour, another hour a week, and a lot of homework, worksheets and practice, multiple hours a week. So let's say it actually ended up feeling like a full-time job, or sorry, part-time job. It was like 10 to 15 hours a week practicing um, to learn these skills. And he doesn't have them. And it takes practice to use them. You can't just say, okay, just be more validating. Like that's not realistic. Validation is a practice. Um, and yeah, emotional regulation, emotional to like to distress tolerance is a practice. It's a skill. And if he doesn't have it, of course he feels overwhelmed. Um, and if I were in his position, I also would feel overwhelmed by the, just the, the amount of emotions and grief and sadness. I mean, one of the things he said was that he's never going to be okay with watching me struggle. Um, because it's just not how he's wired. He always will want to help. He will always be distressed by my struggling. And that's a statement where 
I'm like, I think there is legitimately a way for him to not be distressed by my struggle and to not be overwhelmed by his inability to help. Um, but again, that is, a, those are skills and he doesn't have those. Um, let's not collapse lack of skill with personality type, <laughs> you know? You know, there are people who are like, I'm just an impatient person. That's just how I'm wired. I'm like, well, patience is a skill. Like, it's not a personality trait. It's a skill. Empathy is a skill. Now, that's not to say that some people don't come by it more naturally in the same way that, like, Michael Jordan was born with certain advan advantages biologically. Michael Phelps, the swimmer, like, they did some study where it showed that his muscles didn't pronounce, produce as much lactic acid as other people, so, like, he just didn't get tired. Um, it's a fucking superpower, right? <laughs> like, that's, that's a, it's, it's a skill, and in his case, it's innate. Like, he came out of the womb with that. Other people have to train to achieve it and would may not even reach the level that he's at. Um, yeah, I'll say it again. Don't collapse. Don't confuse a skill with a personality trait or a lack of skill with a personality trait. Because um, there are all sorts of things you can actually learn to get really good at. And it takes a lot of effort. I could practice 10 hours a day for the rest of my life and never be as good as Michael Jordan is at basketball. Um, so, I mean, certain, certainly innate temperament um, is a factor and it's not the only factor. Like, there are people who are incredibly impatient and they can practice you know, 10 hours a day for the rest of their life on patience and become skilled at patience. They may never be as good as somebody else who's like a guru of patience. Um, and they can still get really good at it. It may never occur as a really, a really easy skill, but it's just like second nature, the way it might for some people. And they can still get really good at it. Um, yeah, so like... In his in his case, he's say, saying those things, and I I don't know do not think it's fact. And this is his experience that he's having right now, and it is true that it is his experience. It is true that he is experiencing overwhelm. It is true that he has done everything he can. Everything no. He, it is true that he thinks he's done everything he can, and it is also true that he, th that it, that he has done everything he knows to do, which is distinct. There are other things he could do. He doesn't know them yet, which is why therapists are awesome. Couples counseling is awesome. You know, talking to other people is awesome because you get another person's perspective and another person's skill set, and you can learn something else that you can then add to your skill set and, and approach a problem differently. Um, so, yeah, this has been a lengthy conversation about validation. Um, and, I mean, um, we'll talk about validation again and more and often. Um, I did want to kind of end on um, how to tell if you're invalidating yourself. Um, or how to tell if somebody else is invalidating you. Um, you feel like shit. Because being invalidated is physically, is, is painful. It doesn't feel good. You're shooting yourself. Not shitting, but shitting. I should have done this. I should have done that. Ask the question without the judgment. Well, why didn't you? I was tired. I didn't feel like it. 
Okay, great. So you didn't have any willingness that got in the way. If you, if you actually dig all the way down, I didn't set my alarm. Okay. What got in the way of you setting the alarm? Did you forget? No, I remember to, I just didn't want to. Okay. Why didn't you want to? Because I'm mad that I have to, because I'm mad that I can't remember things. I'm, I'm judging myself for not being able to remember things on my own. I think that's what an adult should do. So I'm, I'm mad that I have to set an alarm and I don't want to. And I think that if I just try hard enough, I should be able to do it. And I'm mad that that's not the case. Okay, great. So you're judging yourself for needing an alarm and you're adding the meaning that needing an alarm means you're not an adult. And we can check the facts on that. Are there other adults you know who need an alarm that you respect and admire? Yup. Is there anything in the, about setting an alarm that removes your adulthood from you? Nope. So those are, those are examples of where somebody would should themselves into invalidating um, and how to then validate it by asking some questions. Um, how to tell if you're invalidating yourself? Oh, judgment, judgment, judgment. And that will probably be another conversation very soon about what a judgment is. Um, apologizing when I don't need to. Apologizing for things you don't need to apologize for. Um, <laughs> the, one of the key ones is I'm sorry I'm crying. I actually noticed that several times over the last hour while I've been talking is that every time I cry, I want to say I'm sorry. As though, I mean, I'm like, why do I need, feel the need to apologize? Because um, I'm, I'm worried about like if my crying will trigger somebody else, if my crying will be distressful to somebody else, if my crying will be distracting. Um, and really it's just what's so... I'm crying. I'm having emotions right now. And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not doing anything that's against my values. I'm not hurting anybody. Um, another way to tell if you're invalidating yourself. Um, if you're trying to problem solve a feeling or talking yourself out of it. Like, I shouldn't feel this way. I should pull myself up by my bootstraps. I shouldn't be crying. Like, it wasn't that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world. Like, all of those things are actually really invalidating. Um, when they're being used to try to shift your emotions. The phrase, it's not the end of the world, can actually be an incredibly supportive, like, perspective-giving statement. Like, the world did not just end. My life will continue. I will have to find a new way to live it, but, and, and, it did not end. I'm not dead. The world didn't end. And that's a distinct, that usage of using it as a form of hope, as distinct from using it to try to talk myself out of feeling something, those are very different things. And there are times, like there are times when there's, when it's going to be one and not the other. Um, I think most of the time we use it because we don't want to sit with the emotions. We'll, we're trying to talk ourselves out of feeling bad. Um, so that's an indication that there's invalidation happening. Um, another way to tell if you're invalidating yourself, if you're hiding or feeling shame. Um feeling that there's something wrong with who you are fundamentally and that it's not okay for you to share it with other people. <laughs> if you say the phrase, it's fine. Um, you make jokes to avoid feeling how you're feeling. If you're stubbornly holding on to how you're feeling. If you have the desire to make it worse. If your feelings keep persisting. That's one of the things I noticed about validation is invalidation is like a dam in a river it stops things from moving and instead of having like a, a stream that's you know a foot deep suddenly you now have a lake that's 200 feet deep 
Um, because invalidation puts your both your like when you're invalidating yourself and when you're validating others, it puts you in a position to convince. Now I'm in convincing mode. And when I'm in convincing mode, I will tend to hyperbolize, um, catastrophize, make things black and white or all or nothing to the point where I don't even believe that. Like I will start saying like, I'll, I'll never find love again. I don't even know if I believe that right now I'm having the thought I won't find love again. Of course I'm having the thought like this relationship felt so lucky. Like, like lightning. The way we met, how quickly we gelled, all of the little silly random things that we actually really align on. Um, like what are the odds that I would find somebody like that? So of course I'm having the thought that I'll never find it again. Um, and if somebody comes along and says, oh, you know, it'll be fine, you'll, it'll, you'll find somebody else, I will respond with, fuck you, like, there is no hope, who's gonna want me now? I'm now older than I was the last time I met him, and I have more emotional baggage, like, I will start to <laughs> reinforce my damn, you know, and add to it, and add to it. Um, to try to convince the other person that that thought makes sense. And eventually it gets to the point where I have catastrophized it to such a degree that it doesn't make sense. And now the other person is even more invalidating because they're like, you're, you're making things up now. Um, but that's, that's what happens with me. Like, I become more entrenched in something if it's invalidated. And yeah, it doesn't work because emotions are fluid. They're not permanent. No one has ever felt an emotion forever. Um, invalidation behaves in a way as to like, it's the function of invalidation is it, it stops things. And so yeah, today, I guess, what did we talk about? We talked about um, participating um, and like fully participating in something um, and validation as a form of participation, fully participating in it. Um, so we're going to stop there. And that's all I have to say about that. Jamie, where are you? And there's my dad talking to my mom. There's no school. Okay, bye. This has been Let's Therapize That Shit with your host, me, Joy Gerhard. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends about it. We'll see you next time.